today I have the pleasure of introducing our guest speaker, Sharon Canavo. Sharon and Mario, her husband, have been married for 34 years. They have three grown children who are all married. No grandchildren yet. Um, back in 1994, Sharon and Mario founded Cornerstone Community School, which was the first homeschool hybrid in South Orange County, which is so cool because my kids do a homeschool hybrid, so that was like way ahead of the time, um, which speci specialized in work with Christian parents to train the hearts of their children in moral maturity and excellent education. Sharon served as an administrator there and parenting counselor for 20 years. Uh, she authored Training Hearts for Jesus, which is a biblical parenting curriculum. And along with her husband, Mario, they founded Training Hearts for Jesus Biblical Parenting Ministry. They have served together teaching and counseling parents in biblical parenting for 30 years years. Sharon is a member of the Association of Certified Biblical Counselors and has served as a biblical counselor here at Compass since 2016. Until recently, Sharon served as the Navigating Motherhood Director on Fridays, and they miss her already. Um, in her spare time, which she doesn't have much of, she enjoys graphic arts, computer design, and interior design. So please help me welcome Sharon to the stage. Hello, everybody. So nice to be here. And I don't know if they miss me, but gosh, I am certainly missing everybody at NAVMO. It's hard, hard decision to make. So I hope you all are doing well today. I want to tell you a little story. There's a pastor that gave a message to his congregation. And the message was on forgiveness, and very much like what we're going to hear today, kind of the act of forgiveness. And he looked out at his congregation after he had given his message, and he said, he said, I want to know how many of you have forgiven your enemies now? And about 80% of those people raised their hand. And he thinks, well, that's not good enough. And so he asks again, how many of you out there have forgiven your enemies? Well, almost all of them raised their hands. It was almost 100%. But there was one little old lady sitting in her chair, hands grasped in her lap, and she was not raising her hand. She was very just firm and sitting there. And he looks at her and he says, Mrs. Jones... Are you telling me that you're not willing to forgive your enemies? She looks at him. She says, I don't have any enemies. And he said, well, Mrs. Jones, that's very unusual. How, how old are you? Would you mind telling us? And she said, I am 98 years old. And he said, wow. Well, would you come up here and would you tell us how you've managed to live 98 years and not have one enemy in the world? So she slowly gets out of her chair and slowly walks up the aisle, gets in front of the podium, and she looks at everybody and she says, I simply outlived them all. <laughs> <laughs> and we can laugh at that, right? You can picture that. And... I, as I read that story, I thought, that is so funny. But then as, you know, I started thinking about forgiveness, I started thinking, poor Mrs. Jones, right? 98 years old. And that woman never chose to forgive her enemies. She had to outlive them, right? Well, uh, I mean, we can live that way. We can live like Mrs. Jones and just wait to outlive them. But quite frankly, I've seen people come and go, moving away, passing away. And if we're mad at them, that anger is still in our hearts, right? It doesn't just go away. Now, there's a saying that says, a life lived without forgiveness is a life lived in prison. And I'd be surprised if there's anybody out here that doesn't have someone in their life that they are having a hard time forgiving. And the problem with that is we do end up in that prison. We end up trapped in our bitterness, 
in our negative thoughts, right? And it spills over into our lives, into the lives of those that we love the most. Uh, it spills over to our husbands. Sometimes it's our husbands that we're angry with and we haven't forgiven. It spills over into the lives of our children. And the interesting thing with our children, ladies, is they are watching us, right? They are so intuitive. Our kids know us, I think, better than anybody else. And they know if we are struggling and having bitterness. And they're not only knowing it, but they are beginning to replicate that because they study us. We are their example of how to behave, right? And that's not what we want. I don't know about you, but I had to lecture myself a lot when I had little ones. What do I want them to know? What do I want them to see in me? I wanted to be the person that was the example of unconditional love, right? Isn't that what you want? That, that, um, just that attitude of grace towards others, forgiveness. And when we are let loose from the prison of unforgiveness, ladies, we actually end up receiving goodness in our lives. It's amazing um, that there are actually benefits to forgiveness. Uh-oh. What did we do here? Ooh, what happened to the slides? Oh, you've got... Okay, sorry about that. That threw me off. Okay, so, yes, there are benefits to forgiveness. Are we on the right one? Good. Whew. It's been too long since I've been up here. Okay, so, first of all, you can see up there, we have stronger immune systems and lower blood pressure. Isn't that amazing? If we are the kind of people that forgive, these are studies that have been done. And that even means that um, they've done studies and seen that the people that forgive have less heart attacks. I mean, we're talking serious physical issues here. We have good mental health. We have more serotonin, you know, traveling to our, our brains and helping us to live happier lives. Um, it reduces the stress levels, it reduces the anxiety, the depression, the hostility in our lives. It reduces major psychiatric uh, disorders. Can you imagine that? All these people struggling with psychiatric disorders, it might be a good idea for their therapists to start with who they have not forgiven. We feel better physically and that seems obvious, right? That we feel lighter, we feel more motivated, we feel happier, we have less pain, we sleep better. And our time spent with family, our relationships become more joyful. We have less to worry about and we have more time to have fun. So our relationships are healthy and we love that time with them when we are released from that anger, bitterness, depression, anxiety. So moms, you truly have the power in your homes to transform them, to be uh, healthier and happier through the act of forgiveness. I want to introduce you to uh, a lady that I would say is an expert in forgiveness. And the reason that I say she's an expert in forgiveness is because she, um, and she would not say that about herself, but based on her circumstances, I mean, she has done remarkable things and remarkable forgiveness. Her name is Corey Ten Boone. Did we get it? And Corey is a woman who, um, with her family, they uh, um, helped Jewish people escape the Nazis. And they held them, they had them in their home and hid them. Well, they were discovered, not the, not, not the um, Jewish people, but the Ten Booms were discovered. And they were thrown into a concentration camp. So they were eventually arrested, taken to, it's called Ravensbrück Concentration Camp, 
It is probably one of the worst concentration camps that were out there. So Corey was in there, her father was in there, and her sister. And unfortunately, her father and her sister did not make it out. They both died in the concentration camp. Corey miraculously made it out of there. And when she got out, her life began anew. She started to write books. She traveled, she spoke. She's an amazing woman. And she even opened her home to the victims of the Holocaust and had them in and took care of them. And based on her ex uh, experiences with these people, she said those who were able to forgive their former enemies were able also to return to the outside world and rebuild their lives, no matter what the physical scars. Those who nursed their bitterness remained invalids. It was, she says, it was as simple and horrible as that. So we have to consider this, that there are actual physical and mental deficits resulting from us harboring our anger and our bitterness and our unforgiveness. These people were able to go on, the ones that forgave, to brand new lives and despite their horrible experiences. And I think this is such an important example for us um, of the very real benefits that come from forgiveness. So I'm hoping today, even as we talk about this serious topic, I know that this is more serious than what we normally do at NAVMO, but I think it's so important. And I have such a hope for you that you will have the ability to uh, really desire and to, to act on forgiveness in the future so that it can free you up to live um, outside of that prison that unforgiveness places us in. So I'm going to read a little bit of Corey Ten Boom's story. I think this is so good. Um, she experienced uh, how to act in love. So it was in a church in Munich that I saw him, a balding, heavyset man in a gray overcoat, a brown felt hat clutched between his hands. People, people were filing out of the basement room where I had just spoken, moving along the rows of wooden chairs to the door at the rear. It was 1947, and I had come from Holland to defeated Germany. This amazes me that she went back to Germany to speak to these people, and her message was the message of God's forgiveness. And it was the truth, she said, they needed most to hear in that bitter, bombed-out land. And I gave them my mental, my favorite mental picture because, maybe because the sea is never far from a Hollander's mind, I like to think that that's where forgiven sins are thrown. When we confess our sins, I said, this is Corey speaking, God casts them into the deepest ocean, gone forever. The solemn faces stared back at me. Ah, can you imagine that? Not quite daring to believe. There were never questions after a talk in Germany in 1947. People stood up in silence, in silence collected their wraps, in silence left the room. And that's when I saw him, working his way forward against the others. One moment, I saw the overcoat and the brown hat, and the next, a blue uniform and a visored cap with its skull and crossbones, and it came back with a rush. The huge room with its harsh overhead lights, the pathetic pile of dresses and shoes in the center of the floor, the shame of walking naked past this man. I could see my sister's frail form ahead of me, ribs sharp beneath the parchment skin. Betsy, how thin you were. Betsy and I had been arrested for concealing Jews in our home during the Nazi occupation of Holland. This man had been a guard at Ravensbrück concentration camp where we were sent. Now he was in front of me, in front of me hand thrust out a fine message, Fräulein. 
How good is it to know that as you say, all our sins are at the bottom of the sea. And I, who had spoken so glibly of forgiveness, fumbled in my pocketbook rather than take his hand. He would not remember me, of course. How could he remember one prisoner among those thousands of women? But I remembered him and the leather crop swinging from his belt. It was the first time since my release that I had been face to face with one of my captors, and my blood seemed to freeze. You mentioned Ravensbrook in your talk, he was saying. I was a guard in there. No, he did not remember me. But since that time, he said, I have become a Christian. I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things I did there, but I would like to hear it from your lips as well. Fräulein, again the hand came out. Will you forgive me? Do you wonder, ladies, as we hear this story? This is a man, a mass murderer, responsible for the deaths and the cruel torture of thousands of women. How can he be a Christian? How, how is that possible? Well, it's possible because of the power of the gospel. Point number two on our outline, understand God's act of forgiveness. As you all know, because we've been going through these points through the semester, God is our creator, right? He created us to be in personal relationship with him. He is holy. That means he is perfectly sinless. He's set apart, not like us, right? And he is just, not only just, but has established the world of justice, the difference between right and wrong, good and evil. And God is love. And I'm not talking God is loving. I'm talking that he is the epitome of love. There is no love apart from God. So even any kind of love that we show is only a reflection of who God is. And the bad news is we are sinners, right? We are separated from God. We've defiled ourselves. Do you know that it is as simple for us to be sinless as to love God with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, and to love our neighbor as ourself? And yet we cannot do that. I, in fact, on the way in here today, I did not love my neighbor that was cutting me off. I mean, and convicted, right? And we have defiled ourselves over and over. And even one, one sin is all it took to separate us from God. And God, in his perfect just um, justice, he has to rule whether we are guilty or innocent. And we know we are guilty, right? God created us with free will, and we have determined to use that apart from God's will. And that's what separates us from God. He knew we were going to violate ourselves. He knew that. And so he also knew from the very beginning that he was going to provide a way to help us. Because as I said, God created us because he wants to have relationship with us. So he sent Jesus, his son, and I know you've been hearing about this, God in flesh. Christ was born into this world so that he could live that life, that perfect sinless life that we couldn't live. And the punishment that he, that is owed to us and the death that we should die, Christ took for us. And after laying lifeless in the tomb, he conquered death. He was raised from the dead. And death no longer had any power over us. The payment we owed to God was paid in full. 
But in all that, ladies, we need to understand that there are two elements that lead us to salvation, which are both gifts from God. Those two elements are faith, and Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 tells us that we have been saved through faith, and this not of our own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. There's a book by Pastor Mike called Exploring the Gospel, and I hope you guys, if you don't have that already, I hope that you will get it. It is an amazing little booklet, and it gives us great information on the gospel. So whether you have little information or a lot of information, this is still eye-opening and powerful. Great book. I, a quote from Pastor Mike, he says, to put my faith in Christ means that I cease trusting in my own resume. And from that point on, I keep my confidence in Jesus Christ alone as the sole provision for my sinful condition. I love that explanation. Our second element that leads us to salvation, again, which is a gift from God, is repentance. Acts 11.18 says, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. He has given us repentance. So again, Pastor Mike's quote from Exploring the Gospel, in its most literal sense, the word repent is a command that tells people that they should completely change their thinking, which inevitably changes their behavior. He says, repent in the Bible is the same word used by the ancient Hellenistic army commanders to get their marching soldiers soldiers to do a 180, an about face. It means a complete change of behavior. So what have faith and repentance to do with forgiveness? Because God granted that guard faith and repentance, he was able to be saved. He was able by faith to put his trust in Christ and the work that Christ did. And he was able by repentance, by turning from his sins to recognize those sins, agree that they were sins, and then make that turn, that commitment that he was going to change his mind and change his behavior. In Corey's own words, he is now asking for a fellow Christian's forgiveness. Can Corey believe that he's a Christian? Has he truly been saved? Have his sins truly been cast into that ocean that she talked about? And Corey continues the story. She says, I stood there. I whose sins had every day to be forgiven and could not forgive. Betsy had died in that place. Could he erase her slow, terrible death simply for the asking? It could not have been many seconds that he stood there, hand held out, but to me it seemed hours as I was wrestling with the most difficult thing I ever had to do. And just my comment on that, she spent years in a concentration camp, and this is the most difficult thing she's ever done. That tells us what a battle we go through in forgiveness, right? For I had to do it, she said, and this is her motivation. She said, the message that God forgives has a prior condition that we forgive those who have injured us. If you do not forgive men their trespasses, Jesus says, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. I knew it not only as a commandment of God, but as a daily experience. And I stood there with the coldness clutching my heart. But forgiveness is not an emotion. I knew that. Forgiveness is an act of will. And the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. Jesus, help me, I prayed silently. I can lift my hand. I can do that much. You supply the feelings. 
And so, woodenly, mechanically, I thrust my hand into the one stretched out to me. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder, it raced down my arm, it sprang into our joined hands, and then this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being and bring tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, I cried with all my heart. For a long moment, we grasped each other's hands, the former guard and the former prisoner. I had never known God's love so intensely as I did then. Ladies, for those of you here who know the gifts of faith and repentance, we know that this is not, this doesn't mean that we won't have a battle in forgiving. And yet it's our responsibility, right? If God has forgiven us, it is our responsibility to forgive those in our life. It's not an option. And then on the other hand, there's plenty of people who have walked an aisle, who have said a prayer, um, but the fact is they have not come to Christ by faith and repentance. And in that situation, they are deceived. They are not saved. 2 Corinthians says, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And John 15.8 says, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Bearing much fruit means the works that, that we have started to do as a result of our repentance, the change of works, I should say. In one way, we worked against God, and now, as a, as a Christian, we are working for God and with God, in agreement with God. We see by Corey's obedience to God's command to forgive that she defied her own feelings by faith. And though she refers to it as a mechanical response, she chose to obey that command regardless by lifting her hand, even when it was difficult, even when the feelings weren't there. She made that unselfish, difficult decision. She was displaying the power of faith and the commitment of repentance. And it resulted in the active life of a Christian. This kind of sacrificial forgiveness, it's an act of humility. It reflects that same humility that Christ showed in coming to this earth and living out a life, God himself, living out a, a difficult life here on this earth. Ephesians 4, 2, and 3 says, be completely humble and gentle, be patient bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. This brings us to the fact that we need to understand the daily act of forgiveness. Corey's battle to forgive didn't end that day with the guard. You would think it had, it would. That was so difficult. I, I would think she would have mastered forgiveness. And yet she shares that she went on to struggle with it. She said, in fact, if there's one thing I've learned at age 80, it's that I can't store up good feelings and behavior, but only draw them fresh from God each day. And Corey was referring to a time that she had very close Christian friends, women that she loved, her sisters in the Lord, and they had done something very cruel and very mean to her. And she was crushed. She was hurt. And she was bearing, uh, bearing that anger, bearing that bitterness. And she says, while experiencing sleepless nights and rehashing the facts regarding the conflict over and over, she finally cried out to God, I thought it was all forgiven. Please, Lord, help me do it. And eventually, Corey confessed this to a friend of hers who happened to be a pastor of a church, and they were sitting in his office. 
And he points out the window and he says, Corey, do you see the bell tower over there? And he said, um, that bell is rung by pulling on a rope. And he says, but after the rope is let go, he said, that bell will still go back and forth, ding and dong, ding and dong, slower and slower until it's done and it won't do it anymore. I believe the same thing is true of forgiveness, he said. When we forgive someone, we take our hand off the rope. But remember, if we've been tugging at our grievances for a long time, it mustn't surprise us when the angry thoughts and the resentments keep coming up. They're just the ding and the dong of the bell slowing down. Corey admits that there were definitely more midnight reverberations, a couple of dings when somebody would bring up the subject, but the force of her feelings were gone. And pretty soon they came less and less until they were no longer there. Let's face it, ladies, the most difficult part about forgiveness is releasing the rope. Right? Letting go. Are there ropes you guys are still holding on to? Think about that. Is there a rope that you keep yanking on that keeps the bell ringing back and forth? Is it time to choose to be more Christ-like, who did not stand on his rights or what was justified, but sacrificially forgave, and especially in light of what God has forgiven, right? When we compare our sins to the sins of others, our sins against God, right? They're heinous. They have excluded us from the company of God. They've separated us. And when we compare those sins to the sins that others have uh, committed against us, sometimes we have to stop and think, are our expectations unrealistic? Are we expecting perfection from them even when we can't give it? Are we expecting them to be kind and gentle and loving at all times even when we can't be loving and kind at all times? We have to recognize the incredible grace that God has given us in forgiving us. And we have to be able to translate that grace over into the lives of those who have offended us. And I know it's difficult, but why on earth would we choose to live in the prison of unforgiveness? Instead, ladies, let's forgive Let's live in unity and the bond of peace, right? Let's become that loving influence in our family, in our home, with the people around us. Let's let that be our legacy and our heritage in life. Let's loosen our grip on that rope and take every new opportunity, because we're going to have more, to forgive This is an opportunity to further be reliant on God. He works on us in this way. This is where he tests our faith. He says, will you believe in me? And this is where he tests our repentance. Though you're angry, just as as Corey was, will you choose to repent regardless? When we're saved, he is preparing us for heaven. These tests, these issues that keep coming up in this life, it's, I mean, just the result of sin. But God uses them as tests in our life to grow strong, to do the things that will release us from the prison and cause us to be in a better relationship with him. He is forming us into the likeness of Christ his precious, perfect son, and he's restoring us to be in the most amazing relationship with him that we will be in for eternity. If you fear that you are not 
blessed at this point with the gifts of faith and repentance, it's as easy as asking God. He says, seek me and I will be found. That's how easy it is. You pray to God, you ask him, Lord, I need faith and repentance. And ladies, he is happy to give it. So we want to begin this journey making a commitment to deny the old feelings and to practice obedience, to forgive the ones who have hurt you. Let's not let our hearts grow hard with the daily issues, the daily options to forgive. By forgiving, we will begin to experience peace here on earth before we even get to heaven. Our life will go better we will do better. We will be better moms, better wives, and a better example to the people around us. We'll grow to be content in our relationships. I hope that this discussion of forgiveness, um, faith, repentance, I hope that it has given you a little more clarity, something to think about, and I do hope that it gives you the hope of being able to live in a different way from this point on. So thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoy your discussion. God bless you all.